In our last video, Counter-Strike, we took a look at some of the abuse that many rights holders undertake on YouTube's content ID. We outlined a number of cases, as well as some of the options that channels like WatchMojo have to Counter-Strike. One of the ideas that most of you gravitated around was this concept of a class action settlement. A lot of you emailed me, you shared a lot of data. So in this episode, we're gonna dive deeper into the context and concept of a class action lawsuit. YouTube is replacing television as the leading consumption platform. The fact that more and more rights holders are equating content ID with copyright law is setting a dangerous precedent. In this video, when we refer to a rights holder, we're describing both an owner of the intellectual property as well as an intermediary that is representing the rights of that owner. In this video, when we talk about a channel, we're simply talking about a channel that has uploaded a video and is claiming fair use. If you've not had a chance to look at the first video, Counter-Strike, it does cover a lot of the elements that we touch on, such as the definition of fair use, the legal precedents that set the framework around which fair use is even explored, as well as the biggest misconception, which is that some commercial activity automatically nullifies fair use, which is just not the case. Following up this video will be many more on copyright, including a show called The FU Show, which stands for fair use, folks, calm down, where we will be breaking down specific cases, highlighting the claimant's argument versus ours, as well as cases that you viewers have sent in to us and confidentially, more or less, asked us to break down and analyze. So make sure to follow and subscribe Context TV. The link is below where future episodes of this series will live on. First off, as the name class action settlement would suggest, the very first requirement to establishing if there's even a class worth representing is what constitutes that class. In this case, we will be referring to other channels like WatchMojo that are creating new works under fair use who feel like they are being unfairly attacked via content ID by rights holders and whose lawfully gained AdSense revenue is occasionally claimed and ultimately kept by rights holders who abuse the uneven playing ground that YouTube's content ID has created. We will come back to this concept of a class and establishing what is an example of a representative plaintiff later on in this video. Second, for any lawyer to determine if it's worth their time to pursue a class action settlement, they wanna ensure that there is a possible target defendant that they can go after. We will explain in this video a number of examples and ways to approach identifying those. Third, who are we kidding? We're talking about lawyers, meaning that they wanna make sure that if they're going to take the time, money, and energy to go after any representative defendant, that there's enough money at stake to justify the effort that they put into the process. In 2018, Google published a post in which it bragged that it had invested $100 million to develop Content ID. It also stated that in 2014, it paid a billion dollars, that in 2016, it paid two billion. If you forecast the period from 2014 to 2019, we estimate that Google has paid out $13.5 billion through Content ID to rights holders. Assuming that excludes AdSense revenue that is generated on channels under the Vivo umbrella, or YouTube channels that are managed by the record labels representing the artist's songs, the $13.5 billion is the notional amount that we are going to be basing all following estimates on. I'll try as hard as it is for me not to repeat everything that I repeated in last week's 40 minute video, but occasionally I will emphasize things that are really important to note. YouTube is a UGC platform, and that means that they do not care who claims the video, so long as somebody claims it, at which point the AdSense revenue monetization could kick in. Meaning so long as somebody claims the video, then they could start earning revenues. Starting off with that notional amount of $13.5 billion, we need to determine what is the percentage of money that rights holders are unlawfully claiming. To do that, we start off with four series of sequences or scenarios. These scenarios are identified by a letter. In scenario A, the rights holder is legitimately claiming a video which would not prima facie 
or at the merit stage of a copyright infringement lawsuit result in the channel who uploaded the video arguing successfully that it was indeed fair use. Basically, Joey uploads Diary of a Madman by Ozzy Osbourne and Ozzy Osbourne's record label claims the views and the revenue from that video. No argument, revenue should go to the label. We assume that 60% of the claims represent valid ones. Now, many of you watching this are gonna be in disbelief knowing that that number could be as high as 99% because Content ID is a system that automatically claims everything and everything. But if I were to do this presentation showing a number at 80%, 90%, a lot of people would just say, these numbers don't make sense, they're way too aggressive. So we're purposely setting the bar a bit lower at 60%. In scenario B, this is simply 100% of the cases less scenario A, 60%, thus 40%. Scenario B basically represents claims made by rights holders, which are in fact prima facie fair use. Scenario A and B add up to 100%. Let's proceed. Remember in Counter-Strike, we had that fancy schmancy tennis court analogy? Well, in this case, scenario C and D take you through the subsequent appeal stage after which an initial claim is lobbied by the rights holder. Scenario C are instances where the rights holder does the right thing and when it is a prima facie case of fair use, accepts the channel's appeal. Or what usually happens, the rights holder pays lip service and ignores, saying that their claim is valid but ultimately, as that ball bounces back and forth, eventually lets it slide because they know that at the merit stage, they would never prevail and demonstrate copyright infringement, let alone damages. So in this model, we once again assume that 60% end up rightfully going to the channel that uploaded the transformative new work under fair use, and that channel keeps the revenue. As we mentioned last week, under YouTube's three strikes you're out rule, a lot of channels don't end up fighting the fight till the end. Therefore, the rights holder unlawfully claims the revenue, even if, looking at column B, those videos should in fact not have been claimed in the first place, let alone seeing the rights holder keep all the revenue for themselves. Scenario D basically is that end game that we are going to be focusing on, which is simply the percentage or probability or proportion of claims that ultimately should have gone to the channel, the class, but are kept unlawfully by the rights holder, either through intimidation or abuse of content ID. Again, in this case, we are using 40% of the claims ending in that scenario, even though that number case by case varies dramatically. Now we wanna state that these are all for illustration purposes and each case varies. If you go through the math, from 2014 to 2019, the aggregate payouts through Content ID stand at $13.5 billion. The legitimate claims represent $8.1 billion. And in column D, the value of the amount of AdSense revenues that is unlawfully claimed through abuse and intimidation of Content ID sits at a $2.168 billion amount a staggering sum, even if it's off by 10 or 20%. Most people watching this video and who manage Content ID on a day-to-day -day basis will tell you that every day is a rectal exam when it comes to managing CID. They'll also tell you that if 2 billion out of 13 billion is the number we estimate going to the wrong party, 16% is probably an underestimation. But again, we wanna be conservative in our analysis. We don't wanna to get too much inside baseball here, but in theory, the higher the percentage of A, then the higher the percentage of C. Meaning if Content ID claims everything and everything under the sun, then in theory, at the C stage, the rights holder should acknowledge that a lot of these claims were false. That's in theory. In practice, most rights holders just pay lip service and ignore the channel's appeals. Oh, look at that. A copyright owner using Content ID claims some material in your video. What a shock. I don't get a lot of these videos every day. Another detail is that when a rights holder comes around and issues a claim against one of your videos, YouTube has stated that it keeps the money earned through AdSense in escrow so long as a channel then issues an appeal. This means that Google, God bless their heart, is keeping AdSense revenue as that ball bounces back and forth between rights holder and the channel. 
In table one, according to our analysis, column D represents the monies that are unlawfully claimed by rights holders. That sum grows from 160 million in 2014 to 560 million in 2019. The sum of $2.1 billion is what would represent, in class action terms, the compensatory damages that represent money that YouTube ended up funneling to the wrong party, the rights holders, instead of the channels. To be clear, we're not blaming YouTube here. We're saying YouTube has built a system that rights holders are now abusing and starting to interpret as copyright law. Compensatory damages are awarded in civil court cases where losses occurred as a result of the negligence or unlawful conduct of another party. Here, that would mean the $2.1 billion that rights holders obtained by abusing content ID and intimidating channels. Now, as I mentioned last week, WatchMojo has been fortunate to have the wherewithal, the knowledge, the confidence, the persistence, and the masochism to fight back, assert our rights, and successfully prevail in many of these claims. However, it dawned on us a year ago that if we ever wanted to explore this concept of a class action lawsuit, that for lack of better words, we needed to set a trap. How did this trap work? In a couple of instances, during the back and forth process, we made sure that the counterparty, the rights holder, was basically stating via email things that would come across as abusive behavior, intimidating our channel and our business if we would not back down and drop our appeals. We did this not just to get them to express themselves on the record, but also because we wanted to start measuring what the damages could be according to these individual videos. We also chose these rights holders very carefully because we wanted to ensure that they could in fact represent representative defendants in a class action settlement lawsuit. And since fair use boils down to not your overall catalog, but individual videos on a case by case basis, we also purposely chose videos to let go, to sacrifice that we're using 10, 20% at most of the rights holders IP. Meaning if we were producing a top 10 music songs that play at weddings and a rights holder was claiming 100% of our videos revenues, even though their IP represented 10% and that 10% was video that we were commenting on, we purposely wanted to cite two specific examples where no sane judge would agree that a rights holder should claim 100% of that revenue. So if you're watching this and in the past, occasionally I've eventually said, all right, we'll agree to disagree. In the Counter-Strike video, we showed a specific example of where a rights holder was clearly acting in anti-competitive behavior, which raises antitrust issues. But that being said, we don't think that the path towards delivering justice to channels comes through an injunction preventing the use of content ID or antitrust. A class action lawsuit, while not perfect, may ultimately be the best path forward. In this video, there's two things I wanna avoid. One is sounding like a 13 year old boy, if you saw last week's clip, and two, getting too inside baseball. That said, ironically, it's worth getting into two specific details. Damages in the context of copyright are different than damages in the context of a class action settlement. If I or you could buy something for $10 to use in a video and I don't and I claim fair use, the loss of $10 is not actually how you necessarily define damages in copyright. Damages in copyright is more if I take somehow a link that Universal Music sent me to an unreleased song and publish it before its release, therefore nobody buys the song afterwards. That's damages in copyright infringement. In class action lawsuits, it's different. If that top 10 songs played at weddings video generated $500 but only used 10% of BMG's works, and if BMG claims 100% of the $500 it generates, I can cite $500 as the damages that BMG caused me. That's a very important nuance. The second irony touches on this concept of harm or damages. To secure an injunction, you need to demonstrate five things. That you have an apparent right, that at the merits you're likely to prevail, that the balance of inconvenience are in your favors, that this action that you're trying to seek injunctive relief against causes you irreparable harm, and that the matter is urgent. 
The key word is irreparable harm. If our channel goes down and it takes days and weeks and months for that channel to come back, that causes us irreparable harm, meaning there is no sum of money that will compensate us for that loss. However, in class action lawsuits, you need to be able to demonstrate specifically what the damages are. So in that previous songs at weddings video example, if we ended up losing $500, think of that trap, and we can show that to a court that the action of the rights holder caused us in monies that should have gone to us that went to somebody unlawfully, then that bolsters our case. Those are two very important distinctions that reinforce why a class action lawsuit and not an injunction or antitrust is the way to proceed. So it's nice and dandy to be able to say that this notional amount of $2 billion is what YouTube has been basically directing to the wrong party. Great, hats off. Now what? Lawyers will not pursue a class action settlement if they cannot identify a target defendant. I wanna go on the record and state that we are not actually at this moment recommending that anybody files a class action lawsuit against anybody. We're hoping that cooler heads prevail and this is a public service announcement of sorts to the CEOs, to the shareholders and to the board of directors of these companies whose employees are clearly abusing content ID, not necessarily through malice, but through a lack of education and a lack of training. That being said, for a lawyer or law firm to go after this matter, they want to see that the amount at play is substantial, but they also want to ensure that there is a representative target defendant they go after. So here, for purpose of illustration only, we're going to look at the biggest abusers on the platform, which are the record labels. Even though the biggest category of videos in terms of consumption are people and vlogs, think influencers, creators, YouTubers, far and away, the biggest category in terms of content ID volume and revenue at stake is music. So the first thing we're gonna do at this stage is break down and estimate the percentage of content ID claims based on category. Based on our tenure experience on YouTube and common sense, we estimate YouTube's music category to generate 30% of the claims, followed by sports at 22%, then movies at 17.5%, followed by gaming and all around other category at 10, finally creators at only 5%, because the theory is, if you're Joey and Monica chronicling little Todd's first steps, chances are that you're not being abused by content ID, even though UMG versus Lens was a case specifically, actually, of a record label doing precisely that with a print song in the background. I know what you're thinking, did I really watch this video for some calculus? Well, here's the thing, the following is basic math. If you take the $2.1 billion from table one, and if you take the 30% that the music category represents from table two, and you multiply it, you get about 650 million of monies that the record labels have likely, possibly, allegedly claimed unlawfully. The biggest misconception around fair use is that commercial use automatically nullifies fair use. That's not the case. We've outlined all the precedents. I highly recommend you watch the previous video or read the articles. In that same article that Google touted the proficiency of content ID to reduce piracy and basically pay off the record labels, they cited that in a year period from 2017 to 2018, they paid out $1.8 billion to the recording industry. Now that 1.8 billion obviously includes revenue they paid out to Vivo channels, as well as the channels of musical artists that the record labels manage directly. So if you consider that $1.8 billion was paid in all to record labels, a sum of 600 million and change being unlawfully claimed or 30% doesn't sound so crazy anymore. The recording industry is broken up as such. Universal Music owns 30% of the pie, Sony and Warner own about 15, 17%, BMG I estimate owns about 10, and the rest are some indies. If a lawyer wanted to estimate how much an individual 
target defendant was exposed to, well, they could simply multiply the market share of a given company, in this case, Universal's 30%, by that 650 million that we estimated goes to the music industry as a whole. Meaning Universal's exposure by itself is over $200 million, followed by Warner and Sony at $110 million each, and our friends at BMG at about 70 million. Now that's simply compensatory damages. With class action lawsuits, the idea is to prevent abuse going forward. This is where things get a bit more dicey in terms of the jurisdictions at play. In Canada, where we are domiciled, most class action lawsuits actually target companies who harm consumers. In this case, Watch Mojo is a company, and while there are other smaller companies who are also adversely affected, by these abusers, the reality is there are also a lot of individuals who create these mashups, upload them, and then see their revenue unlawfully claimed. However, it's also unclear, and definitely not a fait accompli, that a corporation cannot lead as a representative claimant a class action lawsuit in other jurisdictions. Again, we're not recommending or suggesting that anybody even pursue this, we're just gotten to the point that we think, hey, let's give the benefit of the doubt to these wonderful executives at these record labels who maybe are just not aware of the full picture. But it's worth noting that compensatory damages alone don't show the full set of risk. In various jurisdictions, punitive damages can grow from two or three times the compensatory damages to as high as 16 to 20 times. So just using a rough median mean average of 10 times punitive damages, Universal's exposure alone stands at $2 billion off of that $200 million in compensatory damages that they've claimed unlawfully from channels. Also using that 10x ratio, as an industry alone, the $650 million that we estimate that the record labels have claimed unlawfully represents possibly $6 billion worth of damages, including punitive charges. And when you consider all rights holders who've claimed $2 billion according to our estimates, that same 10x ratio pegs the notional amount of full exposure at $20 billion in damages. Remember that company Ingrooves, whom I called out for for being exposed to a class action lawsuit by copying their investors after we had a little bit of a back and forth? Well, Universal Music Group actually acquired them earlier this year in 2019. Now granted, Ingrooves had been on the auction block for over a year, so I doubt my exchange to their investors had anything to do with their sense of urgency to unload of the asset, but it just goes to show that these companies are well aware of how Content ID has given them this unfair advantage in the marketplace, and they're not just reducing their exposure, but they're doubling down. Too much of a good thing is actually never a good thing, and Content ID has now given such an unfair advantage and become so abused by these rights holders that it's actually now gone to the extreme, exposing all of them to massive exposure. BMG, if you recall, even went on the record to say, quote, YouTube's content ID system will automatically and indiscriminately claim any proceeds of artists represented by BMG, irrespective of who the uploading party is, end quote. That's basically a tacit admission that they're acting as judge and jury and equating content ID with the law. So judge for yourself, would a class action lawsuit work? For a court to certify that there is a class representing a bunch of other claimants, they will take into consideration a number of factors, including numerosity, which basically means there's a lot of people that share the same beef, commonality, are there questions of law that are common to the class, typicality, are the claims of this representative claimant actually typical of everybody else's? And then the adequacy of representation, meaning does the representative claimant here actually protect the interests of the class? By now, some of you may be asking, well, is Watch Mojo basically going to be serving as a representative plaintiff? I'm gonna say that you should subscribe to Context TV where we will be continuing this journey. I will say this, that there's a lot of reasons why Watch Mojo could serve as such, one being that with 12 years of experience on YouTube, we have a ton of statistics and data and mainly evidence. Evidence of abusive behavior, conduct, words, and threats. All things that show bad faith behavior. But there are also some reasons why Watch Mojo may not make sense to be such a representative plaintiff. That doesn't mean that we're not here to lend our resources, our know-how, to basically push back a little, but hopefully hope 
that cooler heads prevail. I'd also like to take the opportunity to say that I would much rather partner with these rights holders than fight them. Uh, some of you at those companies are probably watching this going, what the f I thought we were chatting, Ash. Um, and we are, and I'd like to continue those conversations. I think I've just gotten to a point where every time we try to have a constructive discussion, you or the company you represent turns around and says, well, we're quite happy with Content ID. And I find myself repeating, and I hate to use this word, but educating uh, how fair use works, how copyright works, and that just because you have this tool that allows you to serve as a proctologist every day doesn't actually mean that you should be using it as such. To that end, I only use the record labels, not only because they're clearly the biggest abusers, but because it was the easiest way to calculate what the compensatory and punitive damages could be. Another way to estimate what like the worst offenders are liable for is just to apply the Pareto principle, which means that 80% of claims come from about 20% of the abusers, the biggest abusers. In other words, the bad hombres, the worst of the hombres. And if you look at this other table that we crafted, basically, if you assume that 20% of claims come from the biggest abuser of Content ID, 10% come from the second biggest abuser of Content ID, 50% come from that last tranche that make up the top 20%, and then 20% of the claims come from the rest, the 80%, then you realize that a whopping $433 million in other words, 20% of that same $2.1 billion figure comes from the biggest abuser. And that represents at the same 5x punitive damage. Oh, look, look at that number, $2.1 billion. To conclude, based on my 10-year experience at WatchMojo, I could probably write down the names of the five biggest abusers. And I guarantee you that three of them are gonna be actually the three biggest abusers. But on that note, hopefully, this is the moment when some of these rights holders realize that they've probably gotten a bit too drunk, had one too many shots at the bar, and they need to ratchet it back a little bit and actually just respect copyright law. Make sure to follow us on Context TV, where we will be following this journey. We're also gonna be launching the FU show, which stands for fair use, and taking a specific case that week, a specific item dispute, and break it down. And it'll be starring a lot of our favorite players. Uh, you know, the BMGs and the Zephyrs and the UMGs. All companies that we know, work with, but who are mighty, mighty confident behind the keyboard and behind Content ID. Content ID is so invasive. How invasive is Content ID that the American Association of Proctologists don't even recommend it on a day-to-day -day basis? Sorry, I'll stop.